Our subject comes from a very familiar verse to each one of us, Romans 12, 2. And reading from the NASB, it reads this way. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And the convention committee has asked us to focus on the first phrase of this verse, do not be conformed to this world. So Brother Larry, are there any other translations that bring to our attention, maybe give us a little bit more insight into this phrase, be not conformed? I believe so, Brother Ernie. You know, if we look at um, the RVIC, the 2020, it says, and be not fashioned according to this age. Um, Romans 12, 2 in Phillips says, and I like this a lot, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. I like the idea there, as our first slide was. That seems to give the idea. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And then in the uh, CEV or the uh, contemporary English version, it says, don't be like the people of this world, but let God change the way you think. So when we look at these scriptures, there's a molding that's going on with us. How are we going to be molded? That's the question for us today. How are we going to be molded? And that's the question for all of our consecrated life. If we do nothing, Brother Ernie, it's kind of like floating down a river on an inner tube. We're, we're just going to end up where we end up, right? But if we can fight against the stream, if we are molded according to what the Heavenly Father has by being proactive in the effort to fight against the molding or fashioning of this life, we're going to be, sp we're going to be spiritually victorious. So let me ask you a question, Brother Ernie. What is the mold of the world that this verse is talking about? Well, Brother Larry, I think the Apostle John gives us the best description of the molding in 1 John, the second chapter in verses 15 through 17. And we'd like to read this from uh, the NLT translation. He says, do not love the world, nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So in this, we see three components. First, craving for physical pleasure. And Brother Russell sort of gives us the definition that this was undue cultivation of all of the appetites and passions common to the natural man or the human family. He, he adds it's to fare sumptuously in eating and drinking and frolic and, and pleasure uh, to their delight. It's a real focus on physical pleasures. And you know, there's a number of scriptures in the Bible that sort of give us a list of these things, but, but one of them is found in 1 Peter uh, four, two, two, and three, and, and it describes it, Peter describes it as a course of sensuality, of lusts or passions, drunkenness, carousing, you know, partying, uh, abominable idolatries, and he's saying that, uh, you know, John is saying, stay away from this, from this attraction. Uh, second component was a craving for everything we see, and Brother Russell sort of described this as ambitions to acquire and possess whatever the natural eye sees as good. He also says it's a craving for wealth and fame and power and social distinction. And it, it sort of reminded me of the third temptation that Jesus had in the wilderness. When the adversary in Matthew 4, and we, in verses 8 through 10, he takes him to a high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of this world. And he said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, Jesus didn't fall for this temptation, but I think this gives us a sense of, of what can be meant by, you know, coveting the things that the eye sees. And finally, the fourth or the third component is pride in our achievements, in our possessions. 
brother also said this was the disposition that uh, that basically um, glories in our possessions and looks down on those who are humbler or maybe don't have the positions or or the possessions that one has. It's it's sort of a pinnacle of selfishness that avoids the the wants and the woes and the needs of other people who have less than we do. And you know what that brought to my mind was uh, an example from the Old Testament, King Nebuchadnezzar. God made him that head of gold. It kind of went to Nebuchadnezzar's head. He was warned in a dream about the tree that was going to be cut down, but he didn't take it to heart. And a year after that dream, he's walking through his palace and he utters these words. Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. No sooner than the words were out of his mouth that the angel came and said, you are no longer the ruler of this kingdom. And he went out to the fields, to the beasts, until he acknowledged that it was God that rules over the kingdoms of this world. And today we see the same spirit of people going around beating their chest, telling us how beautiful they are, how wonderful they are, boasting about what things they have accomplished. So, you know, these three components are, is what the world is trying to push us into. And in summary, the mold of the world is pride and selfishness and is stimulated by the spirit of its ruler, Satan. So let's, let's go on and say, you know, if we go back to Romans 12 too, there appears to be a contest going on there a contest between the molding of us or Satan molding us and God molding us. So what do the scriptures say about this contest and how is it won? Yeah, that's a good question, Brother Ernie. You know, there's a battle going on, as you say, a battle as to uh, who is going to win our affections. Because who, whomever wins our affections will govern who molds our characters. And so this tug of war uh, that, that we, we see here is a tug of war of almost like a life and death struggle for existence between the new creature and the old. And of course, we want the new creature to win. <clears throat> and so we have our Heavenly Father and Jesus that are, are pulling for us, right? They are pulling us towards them. Uh, and, and as a result of, of understanding the doctrines of the truth that are in the Bible, and gaining the spiritual wisdom, we, we gain an adoration for our Heavenly Father and for His Son, and a, an affection, which you see is there in the center. It's, it's key here. And this, of course, as we grow in the knowledge of the truth, will help us um, by, and this is what the Lord is looking for, is to ask for more of the Holy Spirit, more of the holy influencing power of God. And hopefully, this in turn will uh, bring forth more spiritual zeal to pull us in the direction of the spiritual victory. Uh, we'll, we'll want to go to the meetings, which is where the true church is, where the saints are. We're going to want to uh, have that fellowship with them. Uh, the spiritual media that we have, sometimes we have, uh, you know, videos that we have on, on various programs, on the scriptures, or, you know, various Bible helps uh, videos or, or, or media. Uh, along different lines, we have hymns, we have precious promises that we listen to. Um, these are all pulling us towards not being conformed uh, to the mold of this world. And so uh, this spiritual fellowship that we have with our brethren and building each other up in the most holy faith is all critical to giving God uh, the opportunity to shape us uh, and mold us the way he wants to and not according to Satan, who would like to pull us with his worldly wisdom, the wisdom of this world, the worldly spirit with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Uh, even the nominal systems today, they, they seem to be lowering the standard even more and more. They're, they're trying to pull people in with uh, rock bands and with bingo parties and with ice cream socials that, you know, and a number of other things which you may, you may address that uh, lowers the standards, but it's a pulling into that molding part of the world. And they're making it easier for people to make the step over. Um, the worldly media, of course, is another way that the adversary will work, uh, you know, on our computer programs, on our cell phones. Uh, there's a lot of material there that tries to mold us and shape us 
you know, the advertising and, and, uh, and the movies, the TV shows, uh, all these things um, are part of this worldly media that's trying to reshape, uh, the, you know, and mold us into what the adversary would like to with the spirit of this world to be conformed to it. Even sometimes, Brother Ernie, our, our worldly friendships, um, you know, people that we went to high school with or whatever, and we've had some good friendships, but um, you know, even though there's a lot of good friendships, a lot of times these friendships, if they're not established in the truth, they'll pull us more and more towards worldly thinking, worldly hopes, aims, and ambitions. So this could also uh, bring us more towards uh, that direction of being molded or conformed to this world. And so here's where we have this battle of affection. And uh, time will actually be kind of a measuring rod as to who's winning. And of course, we want uh, we want to have what the Heavenly Father wants for us and win the spiritual victory through what he has given us in the resources that he has given us. So when we look at, when we look at uh, Jesus, he shows us, brother, and he shows us how to win this victory. And uh, I mean, he knew the Heavenly Father better than anybody did. And, and as a result of knowing the Heavenly Father, he trusted the Heavenly Father. He believed in the Heavenly Father. He saw the majesty of the elements of his character. And, and he bought into his entire plan. Uh, you know, one time in the scriptures, uh, there was a ruler that came to Jesus and he said, uh, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So he was saying, even though we would say, well, <laughs> you can't get any better than Jesus. But Jesus was saying, wait till you meet my father. My father is so good. I mean, it's just like, it's an unspeakable thing to really understand how wonderful Jesus was trying to present his father and what he had known of him. And as a result of this, as we'll get into, um, you know, it'll grow our affection more and more towards the heavenly father. And so um, when we look at other scriptures and we look at, for example, the one in, um, uh, let's see, Psalms 40, verse eight, Jesus said, as a result of knowing his father, the way he did, I delight to do your will. I delight to. It wasn't just that he did it. He had a delight in it because he adored his father. Um, and of course, the great commandment, the first, the first commandment that Jesus gave, the great commandment that says to love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And I think to me, that's kind of a, a prime directive. If we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that affection for him will drive us, as we'll, as we'll speak about uh, in a little bit here, to serve God as much as we possibly can. And so um, I guess the bottom line is to, to really see God, Brother Ernie, is to really love God. And to be remolded, we must see God as Jesus saw him and consequently come to the same love for him as Jesus did more and more. There's some scriptures. I don't know if we have time to read them, but Ephesians um, 3.17 says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart, I love the way it says that, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, may be enlightened to see God, to see the goodness of him, and as a result, have that effect of the love of God in us. So when we look at uh, all of these things, uh, Brother Ernie, uh, we have to ask, uh, our next question then, and, and that would be, how, uh, how can we, let's see, am I having this right? Um, how can we direct our hearts into the love of God and thereby be molded more and more into the example of Christ? How can we do that? How can we direct our hearts more and more into the love of God? Well, Brother Larry, that's a really great question. And so let's take a look at the following diagram, which I think describes the process by which our hearts get directed into the love of God, similar to the love that Jesus had. And that, that by this love, you know, we then are ultimately conformed into the image of God's dear son. Now, this process begins with learning, actually begins with study and learning is what results from that. Uh, and, and what we learn is we learn a better knowledge of God, as I think you talked about, his character and his plan of salvation, and especially the example of Jesus. 
and some scriptures that talk about this learning that bring it to our attention. The, the, the scriptures are full of them. But for example, Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. For us to do that, we have to study. We have to take the words of Jesus into our hearts and minds, and we have to apply them. You know, the apostle Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 15 through 17, that the sacred writings are able to give us the wisdom that leads to salvation. So the man of God can be equipped for every good work. And that would be being equipped to be conformed to the image of God's dear son. And then, of course, one scripture that's very familiar to us, uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to present, your body, present yourself a uh, proof to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly or accurately handling the word of truth. You know, we want to be a workman approved by God, but it begins with study and learning what God's will for us is. Then the second part, the second component there is mentioned is, is the Holy Spirit. You know, if, if learning is properly applied in our life and it leads us to consecration and our consecration is accepted, we're begotten by God's Holy Spirit. We become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And if we continue learning and continue seeking for more of the Holy Spirit, which enlightens our mind as to what the scriptures are teaching us, that will lead us in the direction both closer to God and lead us in the direction of becoming a wise virgin who's filled with God's Holy Spirit. And, you know, we have a number of scriptures that talk about this. Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 tells us that when we receive the Holy Spirit, it is a pledge of a future spiritual inheritance if we're faithful even unto death. And the fact is that Jesus in John, the 14th chapter, and John, the 15th chapter, told us that the Holy Spirit would teach us all things. It would bring to our minds the scriptures and the things that Jesus had said. It is the spirit of truth which would enlighten us. And therefore, we're counseled by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 15, 8 to be filled with the spirit. So the spirit, we want to get as much of God's Holy Spirit in us because it's going to lead us in the right direction. And then the third component there is mentioned is prayer. And as we continue learning about God, and we're growing in the Holy Spirit, that will lead us to both properly appreciate and then take advantage of the privilege of prayer to, to develop, to strengthen, and maintain our relationship with our Heavenly Father. You know, we're, we're advised to pray without ceasing. Jesus said, watch and pray. And I, I like the words of the Apostle Paul in Colossians 4, 2, where he says, devote yourselves to prayer and keep alert in it, with the attitude of thanksgiving. And, you know, if you step back and you look at these three components, I think we see them so beautifully reflected in the Holy of the Tabernacle. You know, learning and study is shown, is represented in the table of showbread. The Holy Spirit is pictured in the oil of the golden candlestick and the enlightenment it provides to all those dwelling in the Holy. And the prayers are pictured in the sweet smell of the incense ascending from the golden incense altar. And so, you know, as a new creature, we're dwelling in the holy, and these three critical parts of how we grow spiritually are pictured there. Now, Brother Larry, study the Holy Spirit and the prayer. Where does it lead us? Yeah, well, you know, the more learning, Brother Ernie, uh, and the increase of the Holy Spirit and uh, more of a a greater and greater prayer relationship with the Heavenly Father should move us uh, to even more affection. And uh, there's, there's a flow there, right? And so the more we learn and apply, the more we internalize that learning and the more we gain of the Holy Spirit uh, through a prayer relationship with the Heavenly Father, we grow in appreciation. We, we, we grow in that affection of that father-son relationship. We'll want to... Uh, set our minds on spiritual things more and more in our life. Uh, in, as in Colossians 3, you know, 1 to 3, set your affections on things above. We're going to be wanting more and more because of our affection driving that to set our affection on things above and seeking not second, but first the kingdom of God. It's like 
don't give them your weak sheep, you know, or your, your ones that are maimed. Give them your best sheep from the flock, right? And seek first the kingdom of God in your life. It's going to move us to press, Brother Ernie, even harder for the mark, for the prize of the high calling. And, and as a result of our affection growing, we're going to want to keep God's commandments that he gives us. So how can we do that? But we have to learn what those commandments are, what those expectations are, so that we can be in compliance with them. So the evidence uh, that the love of God abides in us is that we keep these commandments. And so uh, that's what was said in, in uh, uh, 1 John 2, 3, and 5. And in 1 John 5, 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And also we would uh, reflect on John 14, 21, uh, verse 21 and 23. And then on top of that, as our affection grows, we want to not only have more and more fellowship with the Heavenly Father, so our prayer life is increasing because that affection and adoration for Him is increasing. But we also want to have, uh, we want to have communion even with our Master, and we want to try to uh, you know, have fellowship with Him as well. I think sometimes He gets pushed over to the side a little bit, but I think He would like to hear from us once in a while as well. And so um, we, we want to have that relationship with both of them, as well as fellowship with our brethren. Each one of our brethren have a, I think the way I look at it, has a part of Christ in them. And as we go to conventions like this or go to meetings, uh, we increase that fellowship. We, we try to build each other up in the most holy faith and, and help one another along in this whole process of sanctification. And of course, the scriptural um, message in, in Hebrews 10 25 do not forsake the assembling of your brethren you know isn't isn't a suggestion this is this is a command you know this is what the father wants us to do so all these things uh, are very important for us to develop this affection and make it grow but where does where does this lead us to brother Ernie it leads us to humility as it did in the case of Jesus to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God to humble ourselves under uh, his principles of truth and righteousness. And we have Jesus as an example to follow. For example, where he told, when Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You know, the apostle James says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And therefore we're to humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5, he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, all of the brethren, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. So, so that's where affection leads us. And humility then leads us to the next step, which is submission, submitting ourselves to God, to his will, and, and the conditions and the situations that he allows to come into our lives, because he knows we need those situations and those conditions to mold us into the likeness of christ so we delight to do god's will just like our lord did because god's law is to be within our heart and we are to have the same attitude in us as jesus did as paul says in philippians the second chapter in verse five you know jesus was made flesh and humbled himself unto the death of the cross and we'll have to follow in his footsteps and submit ourselves in a life of sacrifice even unto death so, humility and then submission, where does that lead us, Brother Larry? Well, you know, when, when the Heavenly Father gets us into a fluid condition, it's kind of like the slip that you put onto uh, a clay pot when, when you're in the hands of the molder, which in this case is our Heavenly Father, right? And as a result of that fluidity, as a result of that moldability of, of, from, from being humble uh, and being willing to be subjected to whatever experiences the Lord uh, programs, uh, you know, into our lives. Uh, he programs trials. Uh, he gives us tons of blessings, right? But he's got to program trials. Trials are part of what we might call the, the modus operatum of how God works in developing us because through these trials that he programs in, into our life, and, and again, the contrast is the world, they have trials too, but ours are programmed and it's different. They're, they're tailor-made for us to develop certain skills of sonship and the fruits of the spirit. And as a result of, of being tested and tried under these trials, he further shapes and molds us, helps us to see our weaknesses so we can turn those hopefully by strength or into strengths. 
but really it's his strength made perfect in our weakness. As long as we realize that it's his strength, it's the power of his strength, the power of his spirit and his word, as the infusion of that is, is internalized within us, that we can become more and more molded and shaped into the Christ-like image. And that to me is, is the goal, isn't it, Brother Ernie? Christ-likeness. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And so, you know, somebody says, well, that's fine, Brother Larry. I, we should develop Christ-likeness, but what, what does that entail? What are some of the features? So as we look at this next, uh, uh, you might say, character map, it's not complete, but it, it gives you some idea. So what was Jesus like? Jesus was compassionate. He demonstrated mercy and forgiveness. He was unselfish. He loved righteousness and, of course, hated iniquity. He modeled cross-bearing for us so we would know how to do that and bear up our cross. And he was obedient, but not just obedient like sometimes people are obedient to, you know, push and a shove. He was obedient because of that affection, that adoration that he had for his father. He wanted to be obedient, like we want to be obedient to whatever the Lord programs into our life. He was thoughtful. He loved the father supremely as he wants to see in us as well. He paid attention to the father's chronology, didn't he? You know, when it came to the Passover, he did it right on time and he established, you know, the memorial. And even he knew the time and, and uh, you know, the day that he would die because he was, he was sensitive to that chronology. He demonstrated self-control. He could have uh, done a lot of things with the power that he had, but he held back, just like we hold back sometimes. You know, Brother Ernie, he didn't intrude himself upon others, and he was sensitive to other people's feelings. And he didn't get involved in politics. He could have got involved in politics, couldn't he? But he didn't. And so if we follow in his footsteps, we don't either. He, he was loving, very loving, and very tenderhearted. Remember the children when they came to him? He said, suffer them not to come unto me. He, he was very tenderhearted. And of course, he followed holiness. And of course, without holiness, nobody is going to see the Heavenly Father. He was humble, certainly, and he was courageous, the courageous of all of them. He was my hero, I guess I could say it that way. And so all these things are what, uh, you know, we could see in, in what this submission can lead to as we're molded into Christ. And he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And so now, um, I guess we would ask this question, Brother Ernie, in conjunction of setting our affection, you know, on God, are there other things that we can do to resist the world's pressure? There are. You know, one of the first things we should do is not entangle ourselves with the things of this world, but, but keep separate. You know, I like Paul's advice in 2 Timothy 2.4, which he says, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. And so we, we don't entangle ourselves in the strife and the debates and the conflicts of this world. And, and the world through the media, through cable news, through the internet, seeks to draw us into these, these raging debates, get us involved in this commotion. And we need to stay away from this because they're all going to be solved by the implementation of Christ's earthly kingdom. We are not to be bound together with, other believer, with unbelievers, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18. And, you know, we've been granted precious promises that we might be partakers of the divine nature, but only if we've escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The second thing we need to do is we need to strip off the old man, because the more we get rid of the old man, the less there is that the world can attract us with. So as Paul says in Ephesians 4, he says, lay aside the old self. In Colossians 3, Paul says, Consider the members of your earthly body dead to all these fleshly attractions. And I like what Paul says in Romans, excuse me, in Hebrews 12, verse 1, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us and run with endurance the race, the Christian race that is set before us. And finally, the last thing is to overcome evil with good by focusing on the positive. I like what Paul says in Romans 12, 21. Don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Be proactive. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Okay, Brother Larry, it's time to conclude. So what should we say? 
Well, I would say we definitely have a tug of war going on here, Brother Ernie. Uh, a tug of war of our heart's affections. Our affections drive our choices, whether we sow to the flesh or whether we sow to the spirit. If we love God with all our hearts, with all our, our souls, with all our minds, if we do that, our choices will be to please and honor and glorify our beloved Heavenly Father. Satan doesn't want that. So he sets traps, numbers of traps, that he will pull us toward the world and try to, try to mold us into the way the world thinks and reshape our hopes, aims, and ambitions to, to, do, to go and gravitate in that direction. But, you know, the Bible says he's the God of this world, and so that's what he does, right? If we are educated in the knowledge of our God, apply that knowledge in making spiritual choices to develop after the spirit and walk in the spirit, then we will find a spiritual victory where God wins and Satan loses. And so if we look at this, uh, this next diagram, you know, we, we look at this process. So how are we molded by our affections? We're molded into the goal of Christ likeness by ever increasing our affections for God in Christ, by learning the Bible teachings, having a mindset of praying without ceasing, an attitude of being connected to the Father's will, and asking for more and more of the Holy Spirit, the holy influencing power that comes to increase our affections, our relationship, that father-son relationship. And humility is one of the keys, because God, as we know, resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humility and meekness will increase our fluidity to be shaped or molded into the transformational image of Christ Jesus. So Brother Ernie, so how can we resist the world's pressure? Well, in summary, don't be entangled with this world. Don't entangle ourselves. Don't get caught up with humanity and, and it's all of its struggles. Uh, some are good causes out there, but man is not gonna be able to solve these problems. Guard our time carefully. The Lord gives us enough time to be molded in the likeness of Jesus, but the adversary is tugging, wants to steal that time away from us. Don't let him do that. And avoid worldly associations because they will, they will hamper our ability to be molded into the likeness of Christ. Uh, the second thing is be careful of the pressure to conform, you know, from friends, from coworkers, from family who are not in the truth. Uh, resist that pressure. The pressure is there in advertising and media and the internet. Avoid that pressure. And from other church systems, which are promoting, you know, Bible teachings such as prosperity theology, feel-good theologies, you know, stay away from those because those, that's not um, the words of eternal life. And finally, avoid lowering the standards. Everywhere we look in society or the churches, you know, standards are just plummeting. The only standard we should be concerned about is the standard of Jesus. He's the one we're trying to be conformed to. He is the goal that we measure ourselves against. We always have to keep that in mind. And so the goal is do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And I like the sharing that you shared with us um, during this preparation for this, that we are formed in Adam. We are informed by the Bible or scriptures. We are not conformed by the world, but we're transformed by God's molding process into a copy of Christ. So, Brother Larry, in, in conclusion, any final scriptures you'd like to share with the brethren? Yeah, I think, you know, Brother Ernie, the brethren are seeing that this affection, this adoration we have for Heavenly Father uh, is, is so important. And, and, you know, we're going to want to infuse that into the world of mankind someday, that they'll be driven by that same adoration to compliance and obedience because they, they will delight to do God's will as well. Uh, but I think three scriptures, Colossians 3, 2, and 3, uh, I'm just going to hit the highlights, where it says, set your affection on things above. That's so critically important affection on things above not on things of this world don't be molded or conformed to this world they'll try to drive you in that direction and mold you in romans 12 2 it, it says from the phillips and i like this don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold but let god remold your minds and i think that's so important 
that we let him remold our minds from within. And you know, Brother Ernie, I know all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in Christ Jesus. That's what you know the scriptures say, and our Heavenly Father. But you know, in a way, I look at them as our treasure. I look at the beauty of their character and their personalities, their sacrifices, everything they've done to help you know, provide this beautiful divine plan of the ages. I, I look at Matthew 6, 21, and it says to me, and I think it encapsulates this whole message today. It says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I think that's so, so important for all of us to remember. Where is our treasure? It's in the glorification of our Heavenly Father and our appreciation for His blessed Son. And if we keep those things in mind, it'll be a rudder on our ship where we can demonstrate that we love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay, thank you. I like that thought. God and our Lord Jesus are to be our treasure. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing.